This man was a Muslim, but he's now a follower and a believer in Jesus Christ. What happened to him? You'll find out as Shabazz shares his story next on Good News for Muslims. Welcome back to Good News for Muslims. This is part seven of a 13 part series. And this is the program that uh, we've announced in the past and many of you have been waiting for it. This is the time when Shabazz will share his story. It's called My Journey to Peace as we find out what happened to this man uh, many years ago that just turned his life around. So Shabazz, welcome again. Um, I've introduced you numerous times and probably no need to go back over all that but uh, you've, you've told us uh, some about your life, that you grew up in Iran, quite different from where I grew up in California, and you, just a lot of things happened to you. So I'm just gonna just turn you loose uh, in mm -hmm. this uh, segment and have you just open your heart and talk to people about what, uh, how you grew up and what happened to you. Okay, well, thank you for having me. Sure. Steve. I've um, been enjoying these programs with doing it with you, yeah, we are it's been too. a pleasure. And um, as a young uh, child, around the age of four, I, I was always fascinated with the concept of who God is, even at that age, four or five four. years, uh, even at four, I, was, I would look up in the sky and I would wonder, who is this creator God that created everything? I want to know him. I want to know what he looks like. And I didn't know what he looks like, obviously. And I didn't have a reference point my only reference point was the mosque and the, and the, and the mullahs and the ayatollahs. Did God look like them? And, uh, or was he just uh, energy, bright light? Does it, you know, it just uh, was a fascinating thing for me. And I recall even uh, during the snowfall in the winter in Tehran, we were in a high elevation, so we get snow there. And, and I used to look at the snowflakes or look at the blue sky and look at that as a fingerprint of God. And uh, I was just about five. Really? And um, because of my, my uh, fascination with God and religion, uh, my family used to call me Haji boy. Uh, Haji in Iran is a term used for someone who has gone on the Hajj or to the pilgrimage to the city of Mecca in uh, Saudi Arabia. And they become Hajj, Haji. And, uh, and uh, so they get this white hat and, and they've done their responsibility and duty, which is part of the following the Sharia, uh, the five pillars, actually, the five pillars of Islam. One of them is visiting, going to the Hajj. But I, I'd never gone, but my family called me that. They called me Haji boy because they knew that, you know, I was very religious and they would kind of pinch me and say, Haji boy, Haji boy. Really? Now, now t tell us about your family, your mom, your dad, yeah, your uh, siblings. Yeah, my, uh, I have, I'm, uh, my, my brothers and my sisters, uh, we grew up in a home that my mother was very religious. She, she, uh, she had her, she had her secular side, but she firmly and dev was devoted to God and to Allah and to Islam. And she's the one who instilled within us, uh, within me and my siblings, uh, about Islam and, and prayer and how to pray and all that stuff. Was and what about your dad? My father was also, he believed in God, but he was more on the secular side. He was a businessman. He had his own business and very successful. And, what and, kind of business uh, was he in? He was an uh, engineer, and uh, he would he was uh, you know he was more into having fun and all that. And God had His place in his life, but but he was like that. But it was my mom that was that was the one that actually put the foundation in us. And um, and, and what again? What branch of his Islam were we you? We were Shia Muslims okay. uh, in Iran, and, uh, and 
we believed in the 12 Imams and we believed in the final Imam Mahdi that would come at the end of the world and uh, to judge the world. And, and that's sort of a Muslim prophecy. That's or, a Muslim prophecy. That's what they believe about the end times, that's which correct. we're going to talk about that in another Later. program. And that's what, that was our beliefs. And those things fascinated me so much so that as I grew up, I uh, grew older, I became more and more firm in my desire to one day want to serve Allah um, like an apostle, be an apostle for Allah, be an imam. I don't know what it would be, but I desired to serve him. I didn't know exactly which direction it would take me. And I would, I would imagine and fantasy, uh, had, my greatest fantasy was to preach for him. And did, did you go to Muslim schools? No, I did not. I went to regular government schools and, and all that. And, but at the age of seven, something amazing happened. I was, um, we were visiting our uh, summer uh, home in north of Iran, on the coast of Caspian Sea. And my father had a villa there, and we were there, and that evening we were going to watch a movie. This movie is, uh, is, um, uh, is an American movie called The Robe. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a movie from the 50s. And this is back in the time of the Shah, before the revolution. And this is the closest Iranian television ever got to Jesus on the cross. This movie is not about Jesus. It's about the soldier that actually uh, uh, finally ended up with Jesus' robe. And, um, uh, but at the end of this, towards the end of the movie, the soldier is standing at the foot of the cross. They never show Jesus, they just show his feet. And, and, uh, and Jesus dies and the earth shakes and, and all of these things. And, and this man says, this, uh, this Roman uh, soldier turns to Jesus and says, this man has died for the world. And uh, in, in that moment, I was just lost in this, immersed in this love that suddenly hit me. Jesus, the great prophet of Christians, has died for the world? Why? I was seven years old. My parents didn't, didn't face them or anyone else. It just faced me. And your, your whole family was watching this? No, oh, everybody was watching so how this. Many, how, tell us again, how many brothers and sisters do you have? Uh, we are five. Uh, five all together? Yes, and uh, we're all sitting there in the living room watching this. And there are boys, girls? Who Boy, yeah, we have uh, uh, three, uh, four boys and one girl. And, uh, oh, that's the and same my, as you have. Yes, right. Isn't that exact something? same thing. <laughs> it's amazing. And um, must be in the genes. It, it, I think it is something of my dad's. And now, which one were you? Were you the baby? Were I was the, the last. You were I the was last the last. One. So yeah. the younger, and and it seems like brothers. God went after the last. Usually in the Bible, you see it's the last one. Like that, David. Uh, David like, was the last yeah, one. And, and uh, Joseph was the last one, and all that stuff. And, well, he be, he was almost last. There was one more after him, but but um, so I. I fell in love with Jesus right there and right on there. the spot. I fell in love with this man that died for the world. I didn't know why he died for the world. I knew the world meant me and my family and everyone else, that, and uh, all those that were dear to me. And so, so at uh, that point, you didn't know no, really were, about what Islam thought so much about Jesus or right. things that we've talked about, like whether he really did or didn't die on the cross and whether he really was or wasn't the Son of God. Those issues were not part of your there seven non -issue, thinking. Non-issue in my mind. I wasn't even thinking about those It was things. just the movie and the, the glimmer yeah. that you had. I understood at the age of seven that Jesus is not the Son of God as a Muslim. That's what was taught me. Uh, but, okay. but to know that this prophet has died for the world, I believed it. And the Holy Spirit used that movie to reach my mind. And that changed my perspective of Christ. And often that scene kept coming back to my mind through my life before I became a Christian. And, um, and then at the age of 11, we immigrated to the U.S. and we lived here for about a year and then went back to Iran again. And um, when we went back to Iran, uh, in, when I was a year after that, we went back to Iran. My parents wanted to, us to go to an American school so we can continue learning English because we had spent a year in the U.S. And now we can't waste that. We got to get our English better. So we went to sign up at the American school north of Tehran, and uh, they had no space for us. There was packed, full, completely full. Uh, but they recommended another school not far from there, 10 minute drive. My mom drove over there, and uh, as we got close to the school, I noticed right above the school wall this uh, iron sign made out of iron, just a big, big board of metal. And on it, it said Adventist school. And I was just surprised. What, is, what does that mean, Adventist? That's, I never heard that word before. And uh, my, my mom drove us there. We knew it was a, my mom said it's a Christian school. 
but we didn't know what denomination or anything like that. They uh, they had space. They took us. We went there. Eighty percent. Your parents were fine with you fine. going to a Christian school. Yeah, they were fine. Eighty percent of the student body was Muslim, and they they did not teach the Bible to us. In fact, they even had a Quranic class, a Quran class <laughs> in, in, the, Adventist in the Adventist school, and. Um, and uh, but the school principal he he wanted to witness for Christ. So I remember one day one of our teachers was sick and didn't come to school, and he came into class and he had us all rise and he said, "Follow me. Your teacher is sick. Oh, well, you come with me." And then we walked. We followed him down the uh, the the corridor and down the steps into the yard. He took us back all the way to the end of the uh, the, the the property. It was a big property, three four acres. And there was a chapel there. And then the Muslims had never been into that chapel, but he took us in there. And he took us there to have us sit down. I sat on the pew. First time I had sat on a pew. And I'd seen in movies, and it was like fascinating. To, wow, I'm actually sitting on one of these long chairs. Chairs, uh, chairs are supposed to be private. One individual sits on one chair. And, but here is a pew that five, six people can sit, and it kind of spoke to me of a community of believers. And he began to preach to us, and that sermon that he preached affected me greatly. And, mm. and, uh, and that was my second encounter with Christ. And, uh, and, uh, but I didn't become a Christian. He didn't ask us to. Uh, just, just, fel just felt that Jesus is more important than I'd ever anticipated him to be. But I was still a Muslim, and I didn't want to become a Christian. I was a, a defender of Islam. And, and you were how old again at this point? At this point, I'm almost 13 years old. Almost 13. And, uh, and was your brother with you? Yes, my your twin brother? brother was there. But it didn't, it didn't phase him like it phased me. I, I was affected by all of this, but he wasn't. And he's my twin. He's older than me. And um, so, I, I, so what happened was um, we, the revolution happened. Iran is in turmoil. We moved to the U.S. because of that in 1979. And we live here in, in, in California. And we went to school, and in school, um, my Christian friends tried to convince me about Jesus. And Some what school was that? Which school? Uh, Public school? Uh, uh, this one was a private school in Walnut Creek, California. But, but then Walnut uh, Creek now that's that's no, close to Concord and Bay Area, close to San Francisco. Okay, in Bay Area. Yeah, yeah and I, used then, to, I used to live in uh, Pacifica, just south of yeah, San Francisco. Yeah. And 1979 was when I first started reading the reading the Bible okay. for myself too. So well, I know exactly what Pacifica year. is, and, and yeah, and I used to live right there. That was my kind of my turf later on when I was older. All that area and all that. And uh, but uh, what happened was um, a significant event happened in my life that really changed the course of life for me in a, in a major way. And that was when I was 17 years old, and um, I was sitting in my uh, uh, my home. My brother at the time was sick. He needed to take medication. He had uh, emotional problems. And if he didn't take his medicine, he would become violent. And he wouldn't take his medicine. And we pled with him, my mom, my brothers, myself. We all begged him to take his medication, and he wouldn't. And in my desperation, I went to the dining room, and I sat at the table, dining room table, and I started to pray to Allah. And I called all the Muslim imams to come and help make my brother take his medication. He, my brother was sitting to my right in the living room. So you're, you're not, you mean you called them on the phone? No, I called, you called, I called the, the imams you, through prayer. Oh, through prayer. These are the imams of Islam, the 12 imams. That, and they that, believe that they're, that Muslim, we, they're, they're all alive dead. And no, they're all supposed to be in heaven, according to Muslims. And so I'm calling them, because in Islam you can call, it's a lot like, uh, Shias are a lot like Catholics. You can call saints. Okay. We call our imams. All right. That's what we did, and and I called Allah, I called the imams, and uh, nothing to happened. To help your brother. Yeah, for about 10, 15 minutes, and finally I just gave up. I put my uh, I put my chin on my hand, and uh, I didn't know what to do. And suddenly a thought came to my mind: pray to Jesus. And I I I don't know. I at that time I don't know where the thought came from. I know now, but I didn't know where that thought came from. Here I am. I'm a Muslim. I've never prayed to Jesus. Had high respect for him loved him. I would tell everyone, I love Jesus, but I had never prayed to him. So I had nothing to lose. And I did. I said, I looked to the, to the ceiling and said, Jesus, please make my brother take his medication. The minute I finished that sentence, my brother got up from the couch. He had not got up for three hours. We had pled with him for three hours. He didn't even visit the, 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 the bathroom. He just sat there. 
And he got up, he went to the kitchen, I followed him, he took his medicine. And I'm saying, wow, Jesus is powerful. Here I am praying to all these Imams, I name them one by one, and, and I pray to Allah, nothing has happened. And I pray to Jesus, simple prayer. And this happens, and here I am, I'm a Muslim, I'm even a Christian. And he answers me. And, um, and uh, that, that kind of changed everything for me. Until really? the following year, when my mother went back to Iran, took my brother with her, and they went back to Iran, and my siblings and I were by ourselves, and uh, we got odd jobs here at fast food restaurants here and there. And um, it's 1984, and, and I'm about 18 years old, and um, we all lose our jobs. But just before we lost our jobs, I have to say this, that I went, I went out that night, and one night, and uh, Friday night, my co-workers asked me, you want to go out with us? I said, okay. I've been a good Muslim boy all along. I didn't go partying or do any of these things. I went out with my friends. My mom said, be home at 11. I was home at 11. One time I came home at 15 minutes late. I got a slap right here in my face. <laughs> my mom said, I told you be here at 11. And, uh, and we always obeyed her. And you didn't smoke or drink? No, or none of that. None of carouse that. and no. go to the discos like no, I did no. when I was uh, no. 17, 18, 19, well, like wildlife. Later on, some of that happened <clears throat> for me, later on. But at this point, that's when it started, when I went out with these American friends. And I did things that I had never done in my life. So when I came back home that, that night, uh, that morning, actually I stayed out all night, came home at se six in the morning, <laughs> my, my conscience was just... Smiting you. Oh, ew, I was just being beaten. And nothing could make me feel better. Nothing. I, I, nobody was home. My sister stayed with her friends and my brothers were out. And I, I laid in my bed, couldn't sleep, and I just kept pleading with Allah, asking Him to forgive me. And I used the word Astaghfirullah, which means Allah, forgive me. And I said it 50 times at least. And with each prayer, I would bite my hand or my tongue in order to make, to appease Allah, to put pain on myself so He would forgive me. And I did that for a good while and nothing happened. The conscience was just as bothersome as it was before, if not worse. And finally I quit and I just fell on the ground weeping. And now I'm no longer calling Allah. Now I'm praying in Farsi. And I'm saying Khuda. Before I was saying the Arabic word Allah, but now I was saying Khuda. Khuda in Persian is a neutral name for God. It could be the Jewish God, it could be the Christian God, it could be the Buddhist God, it could be any God. It's just like the English word God. And um, that's when God answered my prayer. When I called Him with a neutral name, suddenly a presence was in my room that I'd never experienced in my life. More holy, more powerful than anything I never even experienced and, that. And again, how old are you? I'm 18 at this You're time. 18, and this is, this is the the morning after. Yeah, morning after. I have not. I had not night. drink. I didn't drink any alcohol. I had not. I didn't do that, and I had not smoked any, uh, or anything. that was uh, drugs or anything. I was so totally it was like, sober. What, six in the morning. Clean. Seven six in, in the morning. morning. About six thirty, seven in the morning, and I went to the bath. And this presence in the room was so powerful, so intense full of love and mercy and gentleness. And it was like a wave. My whole room was filled with this thick atmosphere of wave <laughs> after wave coming and hitting me upon my chest, wave after wave, wave after wave of holiness and purity and, and, and love and mercy and infinite power. But somehow I was preserved. And I left the room because I felt uh, inadequate. I went through water. And nobody my was face. in the room with you. I mean, as far as your nobody was in the house at all, in the apartment. No one. I was. I was all by myself. I went back there, and he was still there. In and, the room. Yes. And then, then I, I, I went back through more water, came back, and was gone. Then I realized my conscience is free. I felt no guilt for my sins I'd committed previous evening. I did not ask for forgiveness for my life of sin, only for that night. And God gave me. A, a glimpse of his mercy and he forgave me for that night but I hadn't he was not done with me you the, were just starting the following with day when I said my Salah prayer my Muslim prayer then all my ritual cleansing I put my rug out and I went to pray and I said my prayer and I sensed this is meaningless for the first time in my life for the first time in my life it dawned on me what am I doing 
my prayer is not going higher than the ceiling over my head. So I put away the grog and I prayed with my mother's tongue in Persian. My mom had said, if the, if the Muslim prayer doesn't respond to you, say a prayer in your mother tongue because you need to understand what you're saying to God. Because all Muslims just recite the Arabic words. They don't know, most of them don't know what they're saying. They just memorize it. And, um, and it's then, just like a rote. Just, just a rote. You're saying exactly. the words, but just you're saying it like a chant, like a rote. And 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 because we have you ever it. sensed in the past at all the answers to prayer? You know, no, the, never before that. Yeah. Never before but I. You did mentioned it. that that one time. The, only when I cried to Christ concerning your brother and his medicine. That was the only then time. There was a and that was Jesus who answered my prayer. I mean, and, and never anything else besides that. That was the first time I had a real prayer answered, a, a real answer to my prayer. And also, here I prayed and I, my prayer was not successful. Anyways, I went through a series of downfalls as far as depression. I'm not a depressed person, but I was seeking God. I felt God has left me because here I'm praying as a Muslim, no response. I'm praying in my mother tongue, no response. God was withholding everything from me because He had given me a slice of His mercy and grace. And I said, but I'm not taking it because you need to find me. Seek me and you will find me. And I didn't know that at that time. So I asked my Christian friends, there were no mosques. Please help me find uh, uh, your, let me talk to your priest, to your pastor. They need to help me because I'm uh, emotionally in need to find in God. I know where God is. And that was so depressing for me. And eventually I came to a point where, uh, uh, where I, I was getting worse and worse. My Muslim friends were trying to help me. They were trying to find Christians to help me. <laughs> and one day I was in, in a friend's home, and at this point we we're homeless now. We lost all, all of us, we lost our jobs, my, my siblings and I. And within a month we were out in the streets, homeless. My brother lived in a car, my sister lived in a friend's house. Wow. And you, and you my, go into more details in, in your, my book. your book, Two Sacrifices, yeah. One Destiny, Shabazz's Story. Uh, the subtitle here is The Inspiring Journey of a Man from Islam to Christianity. Uh, this book is available from White Horse Media, and we'll talk about that more later. And Shabbat, as, as you're going along, you know, I'm just thinking, uh, just sitting here listening, you know, we might need to do a My Journey to Peace Part 2. Probably. And so if you don't have enough time to get all this in in the next uh, five minutes, I think we can, can you know, it. you can do go a little bit more and we can come back to it. And But oh, anyway, fine. because I, I, Because, yeah, I'm, I'm very close to that ultimate experience with Christ. Okay. And uh, at this point, uh, uh, my brother called, called me one day and said, you know, we're homeless. I, uh, and uh, my brother called me because some Muslims... That was because your dad lost his yeah, job, Yeah, they right? lost everything. We lost everything in the revolution. And, and my, my, uh, we were just, we didn't have anything. And my brother calls me. We, we stayed with our friends sometimes in their cars, in their homes, wow. sometimes in Denny's <laughs> all night. <laughs> and my brother called me and said, Shabazz, you know, I found this Christian guy in, on the street. You should talk to him. And my friend grabs the phone. He, he says, yes, you need to talk to him. So next day, they made an appointment. I, next day, I went to Walnut Creek and on Main Street there. And this young 18-year-old, I'm 18, he's 18, he comes to me. And he begins to talk to me. And I told him what my problem is. And, and I felt I was in a, a trapped in a concrete box with no doors and no windows. That's how dark I felt in my mind. And he began to break the bread of life. He began to tell me who Jesus is to him. That I had never experienced before. And you were how old, how old at um, this point? I'm 18. Still 18. And he began to tell me, and as he, as he and I walked mm -hmm. south on Main Street, going on the southern, southern direction, he begins to break the bread of life. And the more he says, the more free I feel. I feel somebody's breaking this box apart. Sun, the beams of sun was just shining upon me. The light of heaven was right upon me. I was so filled with his peace as he was breaking the bread of life. And you just met him on the street. I just met him. In fact, the night before I had decided that once he blesses me, because he was going to bless me to, uh, so I can come back to my senses, and then I was going to do him a favor and make him a Muslim. That was my... I had sincerely made that decision that I was going to convert this Christian to Islam. But that never happened. Not only that didn't happen, at the end of the 10-minute walk, he says, will you give your heart to Jesus? And I said, what do I do? He said, pray with me. So he prayed with me, he read a verse and he prayed with me. And I prayed like, I never prayed like that before. And, and then he said to me, congratulations, you're a Christian now. And I looked around and I said, everything has changed. Do you remember what that verse was? Um, I can't remember the verse, <laughs> unfortunately. It's okay. But everything had changed. Everything that was 
depressing had become full of joy. The sky was bluer than ever before. The trees were greener than ever before. Even ugly people were beautiful to me. And I ran with, I thanked them and I ran with all my heart to the, to the cafe where all my Muslim friends were there. I was going to tell them that I became a Christian. I did. And they told me, what's wrong with you? You lost your mind. You're, you're a Muslim. You can't talk like this. And they couldn't do anything to change me. Jesus had delivered me from the darkest hour of my life. For more, more than a month, I was in that condition. And God gave me the victory. And, and I accepted Christ. And I became a Christian. I didn't go to any church immediately. Like I said, I didn't know where to go. But that's for another story for another mm -hmm. time. But that's, that was my experience. And, and, uh, and I just want to say something to the viewers for 10 seconds. Yeah, talk to them. And I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, whoever you are, wherever you are, whether you're Muslim or not, I just want to tell you that what Christ did for me, He can do for you. I know many of you are in the same darkness that I was at that time. And I can tell you this, Christ didn't just find me. He is ready to find anyone. And He is at the door of your heart knocking. I invite you with all my heart to accept His call and let Him do for you what He has done for me. The peace He gave me, He has never taken it away from me. I am filled with His joy and His peace unto this day. And I know in whom I believe and I know you can believe in Him too. Well, it's interesting that you would say uh, he's knocking because I'm thinking as we're, this is unscripted. I mean, we haven't gone through all this in detail. Uh, and as you're talking, I'm thinking, okay, we're getting near the end of this program and I'm, I need to find a Bible verse to share. And the thought came to me to read the verse about the knocking, Amen. which was just, you know, right when you, it was, I thought of that before you said it and there you said it. And so I'm going to read this. This is from uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. These are the words of Jesus. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, which is the door to the heart, I will come into him and I will sup with him and he with me. Uh, Shabazz has experienced the power of Jesus coming into his life. I experienced the same thing, very similar. I, I felt this presence come into my life. I felt a peace and a, and a joy like I'd never known when I open the door of my heart and let Jesus come in. And so we just want to extend an invitation to you that God loves you, whoever you are. Uh, this program is good news for Muslims. It's good news for Jews, for, for everybody. And uh, Jesus is knocking right now to come in to your life. We hope you enjoyed watching Good News for Muslims with Steve Wolberg and Shabazz. This entire 13-part series is now available on DVD. To order from within the U.S., call Whitehorse Media at 1-800-782-4253. To watch the series online or for more information, visit the website www.goodnewsformuslims.com.